Dr. Vinay Prasad here, University of California, San Francisco. I'm back, new video, Checkmate 274. You've asked me to comment on it, so I took a look at this publication, Adjuvant Nivolumab in Urothelial Carcinoma. Here are my thoughts. I put together a few of them for you. Let me show you the paper. Here it is, New England Journal paper. Means it's gotta be good, right? Adjuvant Nivolumab versus placebo in muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. And here they include bladder cancer, about three quarters, and one quarter upper tract disease. I think, I think they actually capped it at 20%. The one thing you had to have to enroll in this study is you had to have pathologic disease at the time of the operation. You had to have either tumor present or you had to have that nodal disease present. And depending on whether or not you got neoadjuvant cisplatin, there were different rules for the exact pathologic stage you had to have at the time of the operation. Uh, you can take out the, you can check out the publication for that information. But suffice it to say, these are people, half of whom roughly had neoadjuvant cisplatin or platinum-containing regimens, and the other half didn't. Um, and there's a mix of upper and lower tract disease. Let me show you that here. Um, it looked like 80% bladder. Uh, and then I think they did cap upper tract disease at 20%. Um, the interesting thing here is that uh, we have the pouch study. Uh, we have the Lancet study, which shows that if you had upper tract disease, you probably ought to get platinum adjuvant if you hadn't gotten in the new adjuvant setting. Um, and I think that data is uh, rather convincing. So here, nivolumab tries to float into this space. They take these patients, they randomize them to a year of nivolumab or standard of care observation. It isn't quite standard of care. Some of these people probably need adjuvant chemotherapy for upper tract disease, and other people in this study probably were eligible for new adjuvant therapy, but they didn't want to get it. We all know MVAC is, a, is, a, is quite something, um, but uh, it is likely underused in some people with good performance status who, who ought to get it, the seminal paper by Grossman and colleagues in New England Journal. Um, let me show you the, the overall result. Here it is. Uh, there's going to be a DFS benefit here, disease-free survival, my favorite composite endpoint. Um, I don't want to get too far along. I wanted to just point out that you know there's a fraction of these patients who are cured. They're cured simply by surgery. And you know that because the placebo arm has a plateau in it. Now, this is a early look at the curve. Um, this is a curve where that plateau is kind of um, a noisy estimate. Very few people are at risk at the tail, but there is some cure diffraction. So even before we started this study, we knew a few things. We knew a year of nivolumab, which is the proscription on this trial, it's about 150 grand in the US. What a deal. And you're gonna have to give it to everybody in the study. 100 people, you're gonna have to give it to 100 people, hypothetically, every single person, and it's gonna cost you about 15 mil. So that's the outlay for 100 people being treated with nivolumab for a year. You also knew when you ran this study that 35 of those people are probably cured already. You might have even guessed a higher amount, but you know, 35 based on what we found were cured already. So let's assume that you cured every single one of those 65 people who wasn't cured. This drug worked perfectly and we increased that and we had a Kaplan-Meier curve that just hugged 100% the whole time. Well, if that were the case at $15 million to treat 100 people, it would be $230,000 per person you cured. Okay, but assuming you cure all 65 people, that's, that's really ambitious. That's a, that's a lofty goal and it's likely not realistic. What if you cured about half of them? You cured 25 people. So you increased it from 35% um, to 60%. Now you're talking about $600,000 per person cured. But even that's optimistic. You really think you're gonna get there? What if you just cured an increase of 10%? You increased that cure to fraction 10%. That's really, really good. I mean, that's quite remarkable. We don't see that too often in the adjuvant space in solid tumors. But now you're talking about $1.5 million per patient, quote unquote, cured. But what if it dropped down to six people or five people? Now you're talking about two and a half mil per person cured or three million per person cured. My point is, before you even ran this study, the authors knew that these were the figures. They knew these were the numbers. And they knew that some of these numbers suggest that under most reasonable assumptions, even if the trial goes swimmingly, many nations around the world will simply not be able to afford this. These are patients who are often older. They have comorbidities. Um, even if you were to cure them, Two and a half million dollars or $3 million per cure, I think that is something that people will struggle with globally to pay for. And they will even struggle with in this country. I think it's the road to bankruptcy and financial ruin if we start to spend that much per patient cured. But this is just the outset. Um, the ways to fix this, of course, is to charge a reasonable amount of money for this or to postulate a bigger benefit. Of course, here's what they found. I've, I've drawn the curve. So what is the fraction who have prolonged DFS benefit? Now they keep highlighting, you know, the percent of people who are free of disease at 12 months, but that's not what we really care about. We're giving this drug up front. 
We hope for some durable remissions. And here's what you see. Let me zoom in on that. Boom, there you go. There it is. And what is that percent increase? I don't know. I'm going to call it 6%. It's a 6% increase in the long-term durable fraction in the intention to treat population. Um, that's what I call it. And if you assume that's the case, we're talking about $2.5 million per person cured. And this isn't even getting to the core issues of this paper, which is to do all of these 100 people need nivolumab up front, or would they get the same outcome if you reserved Pembro or Nevo or Avelu or Atezo for when they had relapsed recurrent disease, which is the current standard of care? In other words, are you better off treating everyone in the adjuvant setting or treating the people who recur when they recur? We don't know that because this trial has not provided enough information and likely we may never know that because it's a global trial run in places where they don't have the US standard of care on the back end for the control arm patients. But let's assume that you know this is as good as they advertise. It's two and a half million dollars per person cured of disease. That's a, that's a lot of money. And it's not just a lot of money, it's a lot of toxicity. A lot of people are gonna have side effects of this drug. And I don't want to get too much into the toxicity issue because we have a publication we're working on that's going to make this point well. And I don't want to scoop myself, but you know, there's increases in all the usual things that come with IO therapy. They always say in these IO trials that we didn't find any new adverse events. Well, I didn't expect you to find new adverse events. I want you to document the rate with which you found the adverse events that I know happen when you give IO. We're talking about excess events. For 100 people treated, you know, there's 12 people with, you know, pruritus, diarrhea, fatigue, nauseated, and perhaps most concerning, you know, there's two treatment-related deaths on this arm. Of course, that's out of several hundred people, more than 100. But, um, you know, there is there is a there is a price to pay for treating a lot of people, many of whom will recur anyway, and some of whom who are cured already with this drug, just to save a few people who you can flip from going to have recurrence to not going to have recurrence. Now, of course, you know, I haven't gotten to the key issues. Outcomes would have been better if the control arm had gotten adjuvant therapy for upper tract disease. Of course, that would have been better. Um, when you talk about real world patients who are gonna be less fit, they're gonna have higher event rates and they're gonna have more toxicity from this regimen. That's gonna diminish your, your benefit. Um, control arm patients who progress, they're eventually gonna get a Velumab or Pembro. And some of those patients may have a durable response, which is gonna change that delta, your ability to have a higher durable responder uh, ratio. And the PD-1 cutoffs, you know, they use a 28-8 antibody. Um, they're looking at tumor cells, TC, not CPS. Uh, of course, uh, BMS, you love to slice and dice it. Sometimes tumor cells, sometimes T CPS, you love it. Um, and um, you're looking at 1% or greater, it looks better in 1%, but we really need to see, you know, one to five, one to 5%, five to 10%, et cetera, et cetera. We need to see sort of that range. And there's a couple of interesting things. One last interesting thing is of course, um, what is this? I am vigor, invigor, or empower? No, it's invigor, of course. Oh, of course. Invigor 10. How could I forget my impassions and invigors and empowers and embraves? Um, invigor 10 shows that Atezo actually failed in a very uh, uh, comparable um, randomized control trial in the adjuvant space. So this also begs the question of whether or not, or to what degree, the, the result we're seeing with nivolumab is exaggerated or spurious. I mean, it would be great to see this as a class effect, but we see over and over with IO therapy, sometimes a drug hits and other drugs don't hit. Um, people say that that's attributable to small differences in study design. That's not exactly a reassuring picture. If small differences in study design in idealized patients can result in the difference between success or failure, what do you think happens when we start using these drugs in the real world for people who aren't idealized patients? I think it's likely that some of these effects will slip away. Um, the last thing I have to say. The authors, with the assistance of the medical writer employed by BMS, drafted and provided final approval of the manuscript that was submitted. Stop using medical writers. Write your own papers. How can anyone be promoted over this? It's absolutely unacceptable to me that people use medical writers. Um, this is supposedly this is scholarship. Supposedly, people are advancing as professors in the same tract as the humanities or philosophy. You can't get other people to do your work, your cognitive work. Writing is cognitive work, and you can't outsource that to other people if you purport to be an academic. I think it's a violation of basic academic norms. And so I strongly disagree with the use of medical writers. Of course, in addition to that, they distort the writing to make it always sound favorable, which is why they're being hired in the first place. Okay, this is one thing that I think piqued my interest. 
which was, um, it was actually the people who received the neoadjuvant cisplatin therapy who derived the greatest benefit versus those who did not receive it, um, who appeared to have sort of a fundamentally different point estimate. I don't know the interaction coefficients there. If I were betting, eyeballing, I bet that's a significant interaction coefficient. Somebody check me on that and email me if you know the interaction coefficient there. Um, why I say this is interesting. What this is telling you is that people who got treated with platinum and still had pathologic disease, that's the group within which there is the, the population um, for whom unleashing the immune system is probably gonna exert some DFS benefit. And it's the group of people who, you know, they have disease, but you didn't use platinum as sort of a test um, of, of their disease biology. Uh, that's probably a mix of people, including people in whom unleashing the immune system is not gonna do a whole lot. So those are my thoughts on this paper. I think that's it. Um, overall, I'm intrigued. I certainly don't doubt that checkpoint inhibitors have some role to play in bladder cancer. No one doubts that. I haven't doubted that since the papers by Bramer and Topolian in 2012. I've never doubted that because I knew that there was a response rate and some of that response might even be durable. What I do wonder, deeply wonder, is whether we need to be giving this in the adjuvant space where we treat 100 people for at most six people being cured. And that 100 people, mostly they're going to get the full year of therapy uh, because of the rates with which the events occurred in this study. And you're going to be dropping, you know, a couple million, two to three million per event averted. Um, I, I use the word cure, but I don't even know for sure they're cured. I should be careful about that, but it's event averted. Most nations around this world are not going to drop two to three mil per event averted. They're just not. You knew this when you were running your study. Your design and conduct and power all assumed an unaffordable product, even if you succeeded. That to me is problematic. Your medical writer is problematic. And I really don't know if I, if I could achieve the same outcome by reserving these drugs for the second line setting. It's the same problem with Javelin 100, which we've written about. Sonny Kim and I have written a paper in EBM, the journal. Um, and it's a problem that plagues this field, which is once they show activity, they want all the market share and they're greedy. So it's up to oncologists to actually hold them accountable, make them do good studies. This study, more questions than answers. So on that positive note, those are my thoughts. Checks, checkmate 274.